this is, this is, this is. Hey, what's up, you guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast. Thanks for joining me. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm, it's nighttime. Um, the sun is down. Spirits are up. Let's do this. I was going to grab a drink, and I never did. Um, anyway, I'll grab a drink after. Okay. I wanted to let you guys know that I actually watched Prey, the Predator prequel. It's a sequel, but it's a prequel. It's like takes place 300 years ago um you know there's native american indians like it's it's like the great plains of the u.s but before you know before the you know settlers came but there there are i will say there are some like french trappers that show up and things like that so like there's it's just like the beginning of the discovery of north america or at least this this discovery that we know about, but um, I uh, I I really enjoyed it. I'm gonna say I I give it two thumbs up. Um, going into this movie, I was not expecting it to be epic, amazing. Like I I was expecting it to be like I don't know whatever, but like I don't know what I was expecting. Let's say that. Um, and it's not necessarily epic. I mean, it was just a good, solid movie, and I didn't expect... I'd, let me just rephrase all this. I didn't expect too much. I expected it to be good. It was good. I was very, very happy, very satisfied. Um, it wasn't some crazy breakthrough, but they did change up, like, the, the Predators a little bit different. I'm not spoiling anything, by the way. I hate it when people spoil it, so no spoiler alert. You can still watch this thing, but... Um, you know, I'm sure if I really, like, analyzed the story and analyzed some of the things that the characters do, I'd probably be like, okay, that that's, like, horror movie logic. Like, don't do that, you know. But but um, it's weird because, I mean, these, these are people that don't know anything about technology. They don't know, they don't know about, you know, guns really like it's like a whole new thing so like they're used to tomahawks and knives and and clubs and things like that arrows bows and arrows so it was just it was cool to see a different take on on the predator story because really it's it's a very similar story to the first predator um obviously it's a new setting it's its own thing but what I mean by that is, is you know, the predator lore is they're hunters. They're they want to hunt a worthy adversary, and so they're hunters of hunters. And that really was was driven home. Let's say they really drove that home, and I, and I appreciated that because that's something that I always carried with me about Predator was, I mean, you, you know, there are rules to Predator. There, he's Predators aren't just going around killing ev everybody, you know, innocent creatures, rabbits, things like that. They're, they're after the hunters. They're after the, the worthy adversary. So um, enjoyed it. You know, it, of course, there's no Arnold Schwarzenegger character in the, in, in the new one, but... I think that's probably the, the right idea, you know, instead of just trying to like completely remake it, they gave it a new twist. It's not woke in any way that I noticed. It's just straight up predator story with a new setting, a new old setting. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed seeing that old setting. It was kind of cool. You see, you get to see, uh, I don't know what tribe they are. I, I think it does mention it, but more importantly, you just get to see some of the, some of the, I don't know, landscapes of where they live, and like, it's just cool. So anyway, that's all I'm going to say about it, but uh, um, if you guys are a fan of Predator, two thumbs up. If you don't like those kind of movies, you might not enjoy this one either. I don't know. It's like Dances with Wolves with Predators. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I have a drinking problem. I just spilled some, dribbled some water down my chin. All right, you guys, uh, mxpeaks.com. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have uh, a show coming up in September, and that's September 17th. It's a Saturday night. Saturday night, we're going to be headlining Music for Cancer Fest in St. Therese, 
Montreal, Quebec. So come on up, speak some French Canadian with us, and um, merci beaucoup. Let's do this. Can't wait for it. But uh, just go to uh, go to our website if you want to get the link. It's right up the top there, or close to the top anyway. And of course, our web store. Anytime you buy from us, it really puts you know money into our pockets, keeps the lights on, keeps us paying bills, and keeps us creating music, which. We have been doing, we're practicing, we're, we're working on stuff, um, working on a cover song. Uh, yeah, so uh, you'll hear from it soon. You'll hear about it soon, but I, I'm still in the, the very beginning stages of it. So um, not done yet. We haven't recorded anything or anything like that. We're just kind of like messing with it. But yes, mxpx.com. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you for listening. I appreciate you listening to MXPX always. Anytime you, you listen on your chosen streaming service, um, any of the, the newer stuff, the new self-titled album, um, anything we've put out in the last couple of years, Can't Keep Waiting is a, a personal favorite of mine. If you haven't already heard Can't Keep Waiting, go please look it up. MXPX, Can't Keep Waiting. Um, if you follow this podcast, you've heard it, I'm sure. I'm sure you can't can't get past it with me constantly blasting it out there but um i don't know i'm proud of it you know i, I love it when people people acknowledge uh all genres uh, not genres sorry all eras of mxpx but especially proud when it's something really new that we've done so can't keep waiting definite definite favorite of, of mine recently worries is another one but i feel like you guys are definitely know about worries um Okay, let's get to these voicemails. What do you think? Let's go. Oh, I thought I pushed the button. I didn't push the button. Here we go. Le let's go. Let's go. All right, here we go. Hey, what's up, Mike? Uh, this is Travis from Virginia. Uh, I had a question for you because I've noticed this in several interviews and some of your podcasts, do you have a photogenic slash photographic memory? Because you seem like you can remember things. Like yeah. Just when they mention meeting you, you're like, oh, I can remember that. So is that total BS or do you actually remember them? That's question one. And question two is... Okay, okay, Travis. Hold on a minute there. Hold on just a second. Um, okay, this is this is an easy question to answer. It doesn't have to. I don't have to go into some big long thing. Sometimes I remember, and sometimes it's total BS. But I think it's important to just go with the flow when it comes to meeting new people and not be contrarian. And so, um, I'll usually remember something about it, even if I'm BSing. Um, but for the most part, I'll, I'll, I'll play nice. And, but Hey, I mean, honestly, I, I remember a lot of things. So if you bring it up to me, I'll be like, yeah, I remember that. I don't remember a lot about that. I've got like a few, like, you know, like you said, photographic memory. I've got a few photos in my head. Uh, but no, I, I am, I do not have a photographic memory that I know of, or at least it's broken if I do, um, but um, I think it's so cool when people do. My wife has one. She If she looks, like she always knows our credit cards, like everything, she'll know the numbers. And, and if if she looks at something and thinks about it, she's like, okay, I got it. Like, what? Seriously? You have it? Really? And she's like, yeah, I, I got it. I'm like, you just, no problem, got it. You just look at it and you got it. Uh, yep. <laughs> ah, it's it's cool. It doesn't drive me nuts. It's actually a thing that benefits me, if if that makes sense. So, love it. Um, but not me, sadly. Let's get to your second question. What is the craziest rumor that you've ever heard about yourself or MXPX on the internet or anywhere? Anyway. That's my two questions. Hopefully no one's ever asked me. But anyway, have a good one. Thanks, Travis. Um, 
craziest rumor I've ever heard about us. Well, there was a rumor that Yuri died. That's kind of crazy. Um, early, early internet days. I want to, I feel like it was like the internet. It was like, it was 90, like 1998, 99, somewhere in there. Um, we, you know, there was an article that got written or I don't know. Yeah, I guess it was an article. It wasn't like a newspaper article, but it was online. And, um, that was, yeah, that was <laughs> weird, weird. I'm glad that Yuri is not dead. He is alive very much so. And, um, this was early on. It's not like we were older or anything. We we're just, we were just, we were just, um, subject to rumor. There were a lot of rumors, though. There were rumors that I'm a jerk, which may or may not be true. I think everybody's a jerk sometimes. So it's like you catch somebody at the wrong time, the wrong place, wrong time. They might be a jerk. You know, they had a bad day. They just had some plan changed on them. You know, I'm a Scorpio. That could that explain something. But um, for the most part, yeah, I, I mean, I'm pretty nice. It's just I'm shy as well and I'm awkward at times socially and sometimes i'm not awkward socially um it just kind of just depends it depends on you know what's the, what's the situation right so yeah thanks for your call let's uh let's see what's next hey mike 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 this is your listener james from salem oregon and uh our next holiday is halloween and so I have a question about Christmas. Uh, the Punk Rock Christmas uh, EP you put out, what's it been now, like two years? Has quickly become a staple of my holiday listening. Uh, one cool thing about it is uh, you feature Emily Whitehurst on one of the songs. Really like her part, really most everything that she's done and is doing. So I just was curious how you two started working together um i would guess maybe something with warp tour maybe that's how you guys met and uh, the other question i have is about okay i like to pause um well is it about what is it another punk rock band with a four-letter name okay yeah let's let's get into emily whitehurst um james we uh we met on warp tour i th yeah um we met on Warped Tour, yeah. They were on, we were on, we got to know each other. We didn't hang out a lot, but we just met each other. Um, and then just, I think, you know, her band, Tsunami Bomb, was a really cool skate pop punk band, like, just in the similar style as MXPX, Atari's, just high energy stuff, and... Um, I think I'm I think that's right. You know, it's it's hard to remember some of these some of these details, but we were on uh the cover of AP magazine for a, a, a warp tour episode uh sorry, episode issue. <laughs> uh, I'm a little out of it. It's late, like I said. Um it's not that late. Anyway, so we were both on this this um episode I said episode again. We're on this issue of AP. We're on the cover. And because of that, it's sort of like, it was like, hey, you know, like we're like bros, even though we weren't even, that was a composite photo. It wasn't Everybody took their photo separately and then they put it together so that they could put it together. So we didn't actually even hang out during the photo shoot. But everybody hung out like on Warp Tour, of course. Um, you know, it, it was... Uh, it was a blurry time because literally you're playing the same kind of show every day, every single day. You're in a parking lot somewhere. It's slightly, it looks slightly different, but, but, um, things kind of blend in, but, um, yeah, yeah. Emily is great. She's on worries on, she sings harmony on worries. She sings uh, a bunch on, uh, an acoustic, uh, acoustic collection that I released a couple of years ago that that was kind of like you know one of the biggest things we had done together is like I sent her a bunch of songs and she just had harmonies on a ton of songs it was great and um she's she's been she's been rocking things ever since you know you mentioned the Christmas 
EP and December's on there and and she sings great on that. I really love hearing her her vocal. Like when I wrote the when I wrote those lyrics, I was like, "Oh yeah, Emily would be great singing these lyrics." You know, cuz I know she's kind of a homebody as well, you know, and I wrote I wrote kind of from a perspective of somebody that's uh, introverted a little bit and um, maybe not just introverted, but a homebody. And, and I, I go through times where I like to be at home, you know, and just chill. But but um, introverted, I definitely am, have part introvert, part extrovert. I mean, I'm both things. It's a dichotomy with me. But Emily was great on that song. She's so good. P Pierre Bouvier as well from Simple Plan sang... Uh, really well so uh great to great to have those collabs you know we're trying to do more and more collabs now and again um not constantly you know because it kind of seems like okay now it's a, like ridiculous but i think when it's natural it's best and that december song was really natural the way it came about um so uh proud of it proud of it for sure so thanks for listening to that all right let's uh let's get to your next question about the a four-letter band hmm not MXGX, but N-O-F-X. Um, maybe you noticed that uh, Fat Mike started his own podcast now. Uh, do you have any cool stories about uh, those guys? I assume you guys have crossed paths somewhere along the way. Uh, it seems like Mike's always got some kind of clever and fun stuff going on, so so I wonder if uh, the two Mikes have uh, had any cool happenings together. And, yeah, that's it. Those are my, my two little questions Uh Hey, thanks for taking the question. Thanks for doing the podcast. Keep on uh, rocking and have a punk rock Christmas. All right. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Fat Mike and I, you know, we run into each other quite a bit. Um, we've played uh, his Punk and Drublick thing, which is kind of a newer festival. He started after Warp Tour is dead. Um, I wonder, I bet Warp Tour is coming back like in 10 years or something like that. I, I don't know. It could happen. Anyway, sidebar. Uh, no effects. Yeah, the, all those guys are great. You know, um, they uh, they tend to hang not all together in group. So usually Fat Mike is by himself or not by himself, but like not with the band. He'll he'll, he'll be hanging with somebody else, his girlfriend or, or whoever at the time. But um, I've hung with him in so many different settings. It's like nothing like... There's a few stories I, I don't know if I should say. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, you know, a few different times. I mean, I just like, I've hung with them just like sitting at a hotel bar at 2 a.m. Just hanging, talking. Uh, and then, you know, backstage at shows and, you know, um, side stage at shows. Like, so, uh what can I tell you? He's a, he's a loose cannon. He's a great guy. He's, he's all, he's kind of like terrible and great all at the same time. You know, <laughs> he, you know, he'll say he's pretty upfront with us. You know, like he, he likes us. He likes MXPX. He, he's like, you're the only, you know, like you guys are great. You know, I, I was surprised when I got your EP. Uh, he's talking about the Renaissance EP. He's like, I'm surprised that the songs are actually pretty good. <laughs> Because at the time we were on a major label, and the major label, mind blowing reality that they actually let us release an EP on Fat Records while we were still signed to A and M Records. So uh, pretty, pretty weird. Like that's just unorthodox and doesn't usually happen. But they let us do it. So either we they really liked us, or that they were like, well, these guys are on their way out anyway. So let's just let them do whatever they want. We weren't on our way out. We're on our way up still. And, you know, that was proven. But um, anyway, back to the, the, you know, Fat Mike was just impressed that we, we gave him some songs that were decent. Now, now he didn't, He I'm surprised that he didn't say anything about the production because the Renaissance EP is very, very, very basic, I guess. I mixed it, I recorded it. It was my first time mixing and recording like MXPX or anything really, really actually anything. So that's why it sounds kind of weak because I don't know any, I didn't know at the time, I didn't know really anything. And 
And nowadays, if you'll notice, I'm not mixing our own records anymore. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. But he didn't mention anything, so it sounded decent enough, I guess. But it's got a it's got a vibe to it. All right, let's move on. Let's get to the next one. Hey, what's up, Mike? This is Shug in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, man, I was just wondering, what's your favorite Warp Tour experience? <laughs> Speaking um, of the I devil, grew up coming to see you and everybody else in the Warp Tour, and that was my my formative years. And we hung out. I remember watching y'all in the batting cages and playing 1.30 p.m. sets at the Warp Tour and all that crazy shit. It was always wild. But yeah, I don't know if you have any Warp Tour stories you want to share with us. But yeah, that was uh, something I was thinking about. Anyways, uh, love you, brother. Keep on keeping on. Uh, much love from Texas. Uh, this is Shug. Cheers, brother. Bye. Shug. Good to hear from you again, man. Thanks for calling back. Fort Worth. Always on my mind, man. Um, love all y'all down in Texas. It's funny because when I, when I, uh, I see people up here that, you know, that I don't know necessarily, but they know, they recognize me and they'll be like, so what happened to Texas? Like, I thought you lived in Texas. <laughs> it's like, I do. Yeah. I mean, I just don't do all year round. It's too hot down there in the summertime. Gotta come up, come up and do this thing. So, um, now, uh, warp tour stories. I mean, I probably should. I know I've told some some really good warp tour stories, and I'm trying to think of of which ones they were. But you know, we started. Let's just talk about you know, 1997, our first warp tour. We got in our van. It was our it was our first real deal van, and I can't believe it it made it, but. We were on the East Coast. We started in Washington, D.C., and we played that stadium, and we were just, like, fried already. So tired. And so hot. You know, there was nowhere to go, no A.C. Our A.C. in our van worked, so we could just, like, leave the van on. And I remember we would just drive all night uh, and then get there early in the morning, park, and sleep, and try to get some sleep. And when it started getting hot, so whoever was closest would, would wake up and turn on the van so that we'd get the AC going and we could sleep more. So that was like our, our routine for two weeks on, on Warp. Maybe it was one week on Warp Tour. I don't know if it was one or two weeks, but we didn't do the full Warp Tour in 97. It was like our, our introduction. We were playing the truck stages and just kind of breaking our teeth, paying our dues, doing as you do and i remember my uh in oklahoma it was T tulsa probably or, or tulsa or, or oklahoma city i don't know where it was but we were we were on the river you know so there was a river that went through i think this was tulsa and two things happened and i might be combining the cities but let's just makes for a better story <laughs> the uh the um it was so hot, and we played on this metal truck stage. And the metal stage, I had, at the time, I was wearing Converse. Now, it's a no-no on the Vans tour, but they didn't really care. I mean, they didn't, like, enforce it. I was wearing Converse, and the stage was so hot that my Converse soles melted a little bit. They didn't, like, completely melt onto the stage, but they, they like, got tacky and, like, were sticky sticking to the stage <laughs> that's how hot it was and we played in and to the left of us a, a ways away not like right on the river but there was a river and apparently and this this might have actually been 1998 not 1997 so this is this is a year later when we did the full warp tour um and we were still on the truck stage so we did the truck stage you know our first year and our second year and so we uh next to this river and apparently somebody i don't i don't know it was later I, I think it was later that night it wasn't during the fest but somebody got so drunk they took a forklift and they like or not a forklift but they just took a porta body and they they shoved it and they pushed it over into the river 
and the city and the, the county and all the, the people that be were so pissed about that. It was like this huge hubbub and uh, warp Tour. And Kevin Lyman was so pissed. And I, I mean, why not? It's a stupid thing to do, you know, and it just makes warp Tour and, and all the people look bad and all the bands look like hooligans, and which we were, but uh, we weren't usually throwing porta potties into river hooligans. You know, it's just a lot of, like around here in the Puget Sound, you know, you always hear about sewage spills and leaks and dumps, and you're just like, what? Like, come on. Like, oh, we all got to live in this water and do this thing, you know. Gross. Gross. So, yeah, there's a couple stories right there. But, yeah, Warp Tour, so much fun. So much fun and a grind. I mean, it was a grind, and, and you know, it was hard, but it was it, – it taught you how to work. It taught you hard work, and, and I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Not that I needed to learn more, but it was just more hard work. Let's get to it, you know. Fort Worth, uh, you know, Dallas area, I don't remember which, you know, which plex we played. Probably like Arlington or something like that. But that was so hot. It was just, I remember we played right after Green Day. Like, it it was 2000... Uh, whatever year they were on with us and there was like so many heavy hitters that year and we were on the you know main stage the whole time right with them um because you know we were i guess we were a heavy hitter too and uh so now and again we would we would open for not open and we would we'd play right before green day sometimes and sometimes we play after it'd be like oh man this is the hardest slot because you're just sitting there listening to their set and they usually do like a 40 minute set not a half hour set they always got like more because i mean green day was huge even then doing warp tour like there it was it was big big for warp tour to have green day on it um but they had so many hits so many hits and uh you know more than they could play in 40 minutes i'll tell you that so Uh, It was a tough act to follow, and we did, and I I felt like we really did our show. We did our show, and we did it the way we do, and uh, and and it's funny just to to think that that you know, but like you know, for for punk rockers um, in in the business, Green Day is it's up there. You know, it's they're up there because they're you know they're they're one of the the juggernauts of punk rock. You know that are still around doing it. So. Um, you know, back when we opened for, for Joe Strummer, you know, in San Francisco years ago, had I known that he was going to pass away, you know, a couple years later, I don't know, I probably would have like really taken that in more, you know, it was, it was such a world, I think I didn't take it in more because I was so, I couldn't believe I was there opening for Joe Strummer, legendary Joe Strummer, you know, what, you know, he's like, you know, like Prince to some people, like like Prince to me, you know, <laughs> Prince to me, but not, you know, not Prince isn't a punker, but you get what I'm saying. Like he's, he is, he's a God to me. He's like a Kurt Cobain type, um, you know, and I, I would say more, more he, to me, he, to me, he's more of an icon than even Kurt Cobain. Let's just say that. Like, if you want to know how much of an icon Joe Strummer is to punk rockers. He is more so than Kurt Cobain. Now I respect Kurt. Uh, I love Kurt. I love Nirvana. I, I, you know, I listened to them back in the day, and and they're amazing. So you can't can't go too long without hearing Nirvana up here in the Northwest. If you turn the radio station on on a rock semi rock station, the end one hundred seven point seven. The end up here in Seattle, they have like, uh, what is it? Uh, <laughs> Like, it's like, they just break into, like, Soundgarden, and it's like, Soundgarden Saturdays, and um, out of nowhere, Nirvana, it's like, boom, let's hear it again, let's do it again, and they just play it, I mean, for a while, they were just literally like that, and I think, I'm sure it's mellowed out by now, but, you know, they get crazy with it. (laughs) <laughs> I'm waiting for move to Bremerton Mondays because, you know, Mondays are my days. Let's make that happen. Move to Bremerton Mondays. 
Um, of course, I'd want him to say, like, you know, to play Let's Ride or something new. That, that would be great. Um, anyway, that's some good stories. Let's move on. Oh, and really quick, just... Okay. Wait, something happened here. Let's do this. Hey, what's going on, Mike? I actually just woke up. This is Gene Everett from uh, now in Connecticut, but you know me from uh, the New York City area, Poughkeepsie, uh, Westchester County, New York. Yeah. And, um, yeah, man, just wanted to, uh, just saw, was going through Instagram, didn't really have a lot to say, but I wanted to kind of thank you. Um, you know, this has been a tough time. I got a pretty nasty spine injury, and, I, and I'm really having a tough time. I, I feel kind of weird talking about it here, but I, I thought this was important to say, you know. I'm somebody that's fortunate enough to have a good support system, but, uh, you know, the injections don't work, medication doesn't work, and uh, I don't want to mess with the, uh, you know, addictive stuff. But you know what mm -hmm. keeps me going, man? Those tunes I grew up with and those new tunes that just hit me right in the heart. You know, uh, me and my chick were just listening to MXPX earlier uh, today, and, um, you know, you're one of a few things, you know, meeting MXPX and just your songwriting is one of a few things that kind of keeps me going. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not on my deathbed or anything, but it, it's been a, it's been a rough year. It's been a rough year, brother. And I just wanted to, uh, thank you, man. You know, these songs, the ones I grew up with, you know, uh, seeing the tramps for the first time in like 97 or 98. Um, First time I ever saw you guys. To seeing you guys a million times in New Jersey, back in New York City, a few times in Long Island, and Poughkeepsie a few times. Just so many memories are built around MXPX and just my Carrara, you know, in general. And, um, you know, just want to thank you. You really do help us get through the, you know, obviously the good times. There's always some MXPX or, you know, any Mike Carrara original stuff playing in the background. But during the tough times, you know, I, people don't usually call and talk about the tough times, I assume. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And I ain't giving up. And uh, thank you for being the soundtrack of my life. And I hope you will continue to be the soundtrack of, I hope, many decades forward. Love you, brother. Peace. Gene, dude, good to hear from you, and I'm sorry to hear about your injury, and thanks for opening up about it, man. It really helps people to hear that they're not alone in, in dealing with what they may be dealing with, you know, and uh, that's very real. People people all over, people that listen to MXPX, you know, uh, have injuries and have things physical, mental, whatever, man, and what we got is we got the music, we got what that means to us and that means everything to me i i, I can't even believe it you know hearing that it, it breaks my heart to hear you're you're going through rough times but I, I love that you're not giving up i love that and and you sound good you sound strong you know uh, keep rolling keep it rolling i'm gonna like i said you know working on this new music you know i'm not i don't want to be out here wasting people's time wasting people's money, whatever it is that they're, you know, I know people buy records and they, they, they want to collect everything and I want to make it worth collecting. And, uh, I appreciate it. You know, thinking back to tramps, tramps in New York city, that was the first, not the first time we played New York, but that was the first place we felt at home. You know, we played CBGBs. We didn't feel at home there. You know, it was a, a cool place to play. I, I tell you that it was like, legendary but it wasn't like a great show for us or anything it was not like nobody knew about us like we played there very early on we didn't play there as a gimmick we played there because we needed a gig in new york city and we wanted to try to get people to see us you know we just tried to get people to come out for sure you know that was that was uh cbgb we played there one time and uh badge of honor for us you know because it was early it was very early we got in a car accident i was driving um and it was my fault and it has never been on my insurance because we paid the guy off 
Um, he was very scary, and he deserved our money. So we gave him some money. He went away, and we went on our way. But it was my fault. New York City can be so overwhelming, just like, what? But it was actually Brandon Ebel's fault. He told me, turn left. I'm like, okay, there's a car right there. And I ran into him, and this guy's mad. So that was, that's New York City. But yeah, Tramps, man, like, uh, I felt at home there. Like, it really, it was like comfortable like house of blues can be comfortable for for bands like us you know a lot of bands like us play house of blues out in uh, anaheim and uh hollywood we used to play there in hollywood before it was gone um all over the country we played house of blues chicago new orleans south carolina um you know uh, florida everywhere so uh but but back to tramps tramps was only tramps it was only in new york and it was the perfect size. It was like a thousand people or maybe a little more than that, but, but really like a, around the size that, that we were kind of growing into uh, in those years. It was probably around 97, 90. We played there with, with uh, Dance Hall Crashers the first, first time we played there. We played there with, I think we played there with Face to Face. We opened for them, or supported them. Um, and then we would do our own shows there and they would just go off and go off. And you probably saw a lot of those shows, Gene. Um, man, I wish that place was still around. There's some cool places around now. Um, but just, it's just, you know, I think Irving, Irving's great that, but it's not like the best scenario, but you know, now that I think about tramps, I don't even remember the dressing room in tramps. It probably wasn't that great. And, and and Irving Plaza is a similar vibe to like a, a House of Blues, you know. And some of the old House of Blues are aren't set up quite right. And and I think Irving Plaza is that it's not set up quite right, but it's still a comfortable, cool venue. And and it's great to see a show there. Like nothing, no problem seeing a show there. But I'm just talking from a band guy standpoint backstage, uh, side stage, backstage, the, the stairway, you know, it's all strange, but there's worse than that. There's, there's definitely worse. So anyway, yeah, New York, uh, what, Long Island? Played some Long Island shows. We played Coney Island High uh, before it closed. It closed like a few shows after, or maybe ours was like the last kind of bigger show. But Coney Island High was a trip. We played there. It was definitely an underplay uh, for us normally we'd play like like a tramps type place um but we played coney island high on our way it was like the last show in the u.s on our way to europe and we were going to europe or england or something like that and i just remember the place just was packed and just crazy and there's there's kids hanging from the the pipes and pulling themselves along the ceiling and I was just like, this is great. I love this. Yeah. Gene, uh, I, I wish you the best. Uh, I hope you you get better soon. And, and I know it might not be soon. But uh, hang in there. And uh, new tunes in the works. And I hope it helps. All right. Hey, Mike. My name's Mark. I'm a longtime fan of you and MXPX. Uh, thanks for letting me call in. I was at the show way back at Cornerstone 1998 when MXPX was playing punk rock show and the power went out in the tent that you were playing in and the crowd kept singing the chorus over and over until the power came back on and you guys were able to finish the song and finish the show. And so I was wondering if you might uh, tell a little bit about behind the scenes, what, what happened? Did they tell you anything about what went on? And if you have any other magical moments like that that have happened to you and MXPX on tour. Thanks for having me. Big fan. Mark, thanks for calling. Um, I, I do, you know, funny, Travis going to be like, is he BSing? I do remember this. I do remember this. And... It was a big tent, the Encore 1 or Encore 2 tent, where I don't know how many thousands of people can be in there, but probably like 3,000, 
five thousand, maybe, but probably three thousand. Now that I'm thinking, Cornerstone felt huge at the time. It was huge in some regards, but maybe not five thousand in a tent. I mean, we played the main stage in in what ten thousand people, maybe watch you. I don't know. I don't know exactly, but um, I remember that. Yeah, I don't. I don't actually remember the reason or how the power got pulled. But I am, I think if I'm remembering, if I am just trying to like conjure some, some memories here, I think what happened is somebody actually accidentally tripped over a wire. Uh, it wasn't like a wire. It was like a big, a big power cable. But uh, I think maybe power cable got, got unplugged and it, and it unplugged the PA for a second. So they had to like redo it. Um, I could be wrong. I don't. I don't really know. I. I just. I just know when that happens, it's. It's chaos. And it's crazy. You know the, what I do know is we were in Atlanta. We were at this um, festival. I think it was called Atlanta Fest. It was at. Um, I don't know. Like, is it Six Flags Atlanta? I don't know what their what their um, amusing amusement park is. But uh, it was in an amusement park in Atlanta, and we were playing this stage. It wasn't like a giant stage. It was kind of a side stage, I, I think. This was early on in our career, uh, and, and it might have even been like the second year of touring, like 96, 97, somewhere, 96 probably. Um, and I remember my mom was there. My mom flew out to do merch. She would Sometimes she would fly out to like big festivals because this was a huge festival. There was a lot of people there. Um, we we're playing and they're like, you guys got to get out to say, you know, they're like, wanted us to stop like in the middle of, of punk rock show. Like we had just started punk. They're like, stop, stop. And we wouldn't stop. So we just kept playing and they pulled the plug. They turned the PA off on us and we just kept playing through it. And everybody just still going crazy. It was just this big this big hubbub like everybody's talking about how we kept playing and you know everybody was singing along it was great it was it was a, a rebellious shining moment in 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 mx pieces history for sure i remember that but uh, <laughs> there's there's lots of times like that too um just randomly like things happening on stage where you just the something goes out and you like the microphone go out you know and you just, what do you do you go to the other microphone and if that doesn't work then you just you got to go you know yell into the crowd but let's do one more i i uh, appreciate you guys calls by the way if you guys want to uh call in to the show and ask a question or Maybe you have a topic you want me to talk about. Please do. The number is 360-830-6660. It's Google Voicemail. And uh, yeah, if you call in, you're going to be on the podcast just like what you hear here. I'm going to play your voicemail to the public. So just remember that. <laughs> and uh, we'll be good. And I got a, you know, there's a bunch more podcast, or sorry, a bunch more voicemails that I, I can't necessarily get to at all at one time, but I'll get to them. I'll get to them, and I appreciate your calls. So uh, let's do one more. Hey, Mike. Uh, my name is Chris Miller. Uh, I live in Canton, Ohio, and I've been a big fan for, shoot, since 99, so 20, 23 years. Uh, but anyway, I have a couple quick questions for you. Um, the first one is, back when Secret Weapon was getting ready to come out, like the weekend before, you guys played a house party just outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, me and one of my friends that actually drove out there to see you guys play, um, and it was rad. I had the, my left Paul in my car, and you guys signed it, and uh, it was just, it was awesome. But um, anyways, my question was, how did that come about? Like, uh I would assume that it was a friend of yours uh, or one of you guys' and just how that came about, why that came about, um, and just any kind of background info you can remember about that. Mm -hmm. The second question. Okay. Chris, what's up? 
Um, I do remember that. <laughs> oh my gosh, Travis! Travis is gonna be like he's he's making all this up. Um, no, I remember that uh, Pittsburgh. Um, we were literally in a bus and we were on an album. Yeah, we were on an, a promo tour. Meaning a promo tour is usually a little different than a regular tour. A promo tour is you're doing a lot of in stores. You're doing a lot of uh, promo stops where you're, you're going to radio stations and still doing shows as well. Shows, shows, but you might have more days off to do some extra stuff like that kind of kind of weird stuff. So anyway, we um, I don't re honestly remember how that came about. I, I assume it was a friend. Somebody we knew was like, hey, we, we, you guys want to play a party? I got this house, blah, blah, blah. We probably were like, we had a day off or something like that and needed to go. I know we needed pictures. So, like, we, did we take pictures? I know we took pictures, but, like, we didn't have a professional photographer with us, I don't think. So... I don't know. I think uh, I think we were on a promo tour and we we're literally just just like we would do weird things like that sometimes. And Tommy Rat was our tour manager slash sound guy, and he would do things like that. Definitely, he would plan. He would like when we he would plan days off for us, and not just days off, but he would plan something for us to do. Now, playing a party is not a day off necessarily because we're actually playing, but but he was just known to, like, when we went to Indonesia the first time, we, after the shows, after we did a bunch of shows, and, and that when actually we only, maybe the first time we only did one show. So we did the show, and then we went to this, like, resort for, like, three days, and it was just such a trip. We were, like, out on the ocean, and... And it was like a tiny little village and we just hung out and just got like $5 massages. Like literally it was $5 for a massage. Okay. So Tom got, Tommy, not Tom, Tom, Tommy got like a massage by three, three masseuse, massage therapists. Sorry. I don't know. Do you even call it that? They're just like village people. Like literally these are just village people. <laughs> That sounds crazy. It was crazy. It was crazy. Uh, it was not, uh, uh, as far as I know, it was not re uh, massage with release, so with happy ending. So, um, but anyway, $5 per person. Like, so he was like, I'm going to spend $15 and just get like three. He was like, it actually, so he came back with the review. I'm like, we're like, L let, let me know what you, what, how it was. <laughs> and he's like, well, it was, uh, Actually, it was it wasn't that great because I couldn't really concentrate on one one feeling good because it was like there was too much. It was too much good, so yeah, <laughs> no good. Uh, I got a massage. I just I opted for the five dollar massage, and it was not good. It was terrible. It was just a uh, person just doing that kind of, which I had a, a terrible massage in Russia as well. Like just like. The person doing nothing like okay all right see ya but uh anyway i've had many many great massages especially in hawaii hawaii is great um let's get to did i answer your question i think i did yeah pittsburgh um it was like a frat house it was literally like a frat house it was fun but uh we didn't do that every now and then we, we did something like that but we didn't do that too often that was very very rare is I play in a band called Fear the Lion. Um, we are based out of San Diego. I lived out there for uh, 11 years. I've been back in Ohio for about two now. Um, but we're still trying to make things work across the country. Um, we're, we're getting ready to go back to the blasting room to record our third EP there. And so we're trying to do things professional. We're trying to do things the right way. But obviously it's difficult. We can't play local shows. We can't really get our names out there. Um, and we're doing all that we can on social media and whatnot. But um, my question is, would you be open to having us on your podcast sometime to talk about that? Because, you know, obviously now that you're in Texas and the other guys are in Bremerton still, you know, kind of in the same boat, different circumstances because everybody knows who you guys are <laughs> and nobody really knows anything about it. So I think it would be 
great to come on and have a conversation about that and uh, give us some insight and some wisdom and and give that to other people listening because there are probably other listeners who are in the same situation. But um, I know you're going to beat this out, but if you want to talk to me, my phone number is 330 And I'd love to hear from you and talk about that if you're interested. Um, but other than that, thank you again so much for all the music over the years all the great memories I have because of you guys and what you've meant to me in my life. And uh, super stoked to hear the new stuff. So uh, thanks, man. Talk to you soon. Bye. Yeah. Thanks for calling Chris. Um, yeah. I mean, it is a tricky situation when you have band members, long distance relationships, you know um, what I would say is, you have to change it up. You have to be in contact a lot, like text, do the group texting or whatever, however you do that. That's kind of important. Um, when I'm, you know, we're a little different because you know, I'm in, in Texas part-time and then and I come back and I'm here. So um, I do text with them, you know. So, you know, we have a group text. We text back and forth. I'll be like, hey, check out this link. Tom will send me a link or all of us a link, or whatever, Um, you know, we'll talk about gear, or whatever, Um, as far as, like, actually, literally getting things done, the nitty-gritty of putting songs together, being ready to record, uh, that is tricky when you are are long distance, it kind of depends on who's where, and who does what, so, like, if we were, you know, if I was without the guys, I can write the songs, but I can't, we can't put them together separately, not for the most part. I mean, we could do maybe a song, but but we need to be in the same room together, playing, working out parts, MXPX affine the song, right? That's what I call it or whatever, you know, doing the things that we do as musicians together. And if you can, if you have a drummer and a guitar or bass player in the same area, same city, they could get together. It's possible. Then you can work out the parts because really working out the drums is the most important part. Working out the how the drums go, because how the drums go is also how the guitars and bass go because it has to like, you know, adhere to those those rhythms. So um, I don't know. It's not easy because I mean a lot of times you know either I'm gone to Texas or sometimes Tom will be out of town for his other work stuff. Um, I mean, it, it, it's probably one of the hardest parts of doing what we do is not being together all the time, having to deal with personal schedules and, and personal meaning, you know, Tom and Yuri, Tom and having his schedule, Yuri having his, like they're all different from what I'm doing. And so, you know, everybody's absolutely down with doing it it's just to get on that same page you have to be in communication so i'm going to boil this all down to the key is communication um anything's possible you just have to find your own way of doing it and if you're gonna like you know get on facetime or something like that where you can see the guys uh, you know if you're the only one in ohio and everybody else is in california you need to get on FaceTime at least, you know, once every now and again with all those dudes. Maybe they can get together and practice the songs, go through the songs while you're there. And here's here's something you could do. If you don't want to do FaceTime, you could do, uh, you could all maybe do that as well as have them put their practice on a private Facebook group so that you could be part of that Facebook group and you could see it. And I say Facebook because it's just the easiest way to do it and it doesn't cost any money and it's it doesn't really take any time because your 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 video is compressed and it's right there on the on the screen so anybody can access it that's in your group from anywhere in the world. So you could do that so that You could watch their practice and take notes or, you know, I don't know how crazy you're getting, but yeah, take notes and and make changes and and have those guys try, hey, try this, here's an idea, you know, that kind of thing. Now, maybe that won't work and and whatever, but um, that's 
it's worked for us in the past, you know, for, for little things here and there, like we'll, we'll work on something and then, you know, I'll send a demo out to the rest of the guys of what we worked on, you know, from that same feed, from that like Facebook group feed or whatever. So anyway, a little, a little bit there. Um, as far as the podcast, I don't know, maybe someday, maybe someday you come on. Um, let me know when the record's coming out. I'll check it out or see, uh, see what makes sense. Uh, wish, wish you the best of luck. And I hope, hope some of that, that makes sense, but communication. And I don't mean in a weird way. I just mean, be talking to those guys a, a lot, um, in a regular way, not in a Let's talk guys. Like not in like, let's have a meeting. I just mean, it doesn't always have to be about band stuff. It could be about just whatever your favorite sports team is or, or whatever crazy shit is going on in the world, whatever that is, right? Like, share it with your your bandmates and just as you do your your friends um and honestly like that's that's good advice for us for all of us in bands i'm a band guy <laughs> thank you guys so much for uh for tuning into the podcast i appreciate it thanks for subscribing if you haven't already subscribed you're just listening i appreciate a, a sub and uh head out to my youtube channel and my YouTube channel is Mike Herrera Video. If you're watching this episode on my YouTube, you're already there. Please like it. Please subscribe to my YouTube. Would love, would love to uh, have you as part of the part of the family. All right. Um, and of course, we're on the we're on Facebook. We have a private Facebook group called Mike Herrera Podcast and Instagram and Twitter as well. Um, all right. That's it. Shout out to Bob McKnight. Check out his podcast, The Bob and Katie Show. Fun stuff if you just need to unplug and just hear bizarre stories. Like, I don't know how he gets into the predicaments that he gets into, but Bob cracks me up. <laughs> so uh, thanks to Bob, the producer. Um, all right, you guys. Until next week, peace out. <laughs>